Good afternoon, and welcome to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. My name is Susan Derwin, and I am the Center Director. Thank you all so much for coming to today's event, which is part of our year-long series, Imagining California. We've designed the, the series to explore the history, stories, and innovations that created California, and also to explore the challenges and possibilities that lie in the state's future. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people, who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the IHC is located, and pay respect to elders past and present, as well as other indigenous people here today. Our guest today, Mark Arax, is an investigative reporter whose journalism and literary nonfiction have significantly deepened and enriched the complex chronicle of California's environmental and social history. His feature stories and books have been recognized both for the incisive significance of their subject matter and the lyric quality of the writing itself. Eric's graduated from Fresno State and Columbia University, and he was a staff writer at the Los Angeles Times. He has taught literary nonfiction at Claremont McKenna College and Fresno State University. In addition to publishing in the New York Times and the California Sunday Magazine, he has written or co-written four books, all of which draw upon and reflect his personal history as a member of a California sent of as a member of a family of California Central Valley farmers. That history includes the unsolved murder of his father at his father's nightclub in Fresno when Mark was 15 years old. His first book, a memoir entitled In My Father's Name, recounts his decades-long search to find his father's murderers. His second co-authored book, The King of California, tells the story of the Boswell family farming empire, California's first giant agribusiness. The book won a 2004 California Book Award and the 2005 William Soroyan International Writing Prize from Stanford University. Eric's third book is a collection of stories titled West of the West, Dreamers, Believers, Builders, and Killers in the Golden State. A reviewer described the book as, quote, a high literary enterprise that beautifully integrates the private and idiosyncratic with the sweep of great historical forces. Erex's best-selling and critically acclaimed fourth book, The Dreamt Land, considers one dream in particular that proved to be instrumental in creating the California we inhabit today. Better described as an environmental nightmare, that dream entailed, if not the moving of mountains, then a feat equal to it. In Arax's words, the greatest human alteration of a physical environment in history. I love Mark's work, and I was thrilled when he agreed to discuss the dream of a fertile landscape in the desert in our Imagining California series. Please join me in welcoming Mark to speak now on The Dreamt Land, How the Invention of California Became Miracle and Ruin. Thank you, Susan. I thought I gave you a paragraph, just one paragraph of background. Where'd you get all that at? And that was, yeah, it was good. Okay. Very nice to be here. Um, uh, it's a special place. I drove through the storm. It was really weird. I drove up 99. I thought, I'm not going to take the coastal route. I'm going to go through the heartland, which I know well. When I hit Kern County, it was a dust storm that I imagine the Jodes had left back in Oklahoma. Uh, I was dodging uh, tumbleweeds on Highway 99. Went up and then came across Santa, you know, the 126 that way and hit a major rainstorm. So then I came and it was, the coast was beautiful, so I blew it. I, I took the wrong route. <laughs> <clears throat> I grew up in Fresno. And by the time I was growing up, we had sold our last ranch, they called it. Ranch. I mean, I don't know why farmers called their farms ranches. I think it conjured up some 
something. There, there, there was no spread, no cattle. Uh, it was uh, figs, peaches, plums, pomegranates, and grapes. And by the time I was growing up, we were living in suburban Fresno. So the farm, which was a last farm, which was along the San Joaquin River, I would visit at the end of this book, The Dremp Land, looking for pomegranates, finding pomegranate lane and pomegranate court and pomegranate street, but not a single pomegranate. So um, my dad's and, and his brother and my grandfather started this chain of grocery stores called Peacock Markets. And by the mid-1960s, we had six of them. And I loved, they, they would dress me up in a gross, grocer's smock. It was yellow. And then, and then um, they would give me something to stamp the cans. And I'd go down the aisles. And uh, I loved the, the, the neon sign. It was this peacock in, in full plumage with this gorgeous iridescence that came out with all the fluorescent lights. And um, I manned the what, halls and the other the place, and I would see guys taking meat and shoving it down their pants, and you know, just, just stealing, and I'd report it to my dad. And then, um, as karma would have it, uh, the butcher f caught me stealing some baseball cards. <laughs> I you know, had chewing gum in it and baseball cards. And my dad took me in the room where they would all talk to all the guys who they caught stealing and tell them never to do that again. Never call the cops, though. And he said, listen, we own this place. You don't have to steal anything. So that was a great lesson. In the late 60s, uh, we couldn't survive anymore because Safeway and all those chains had come. And they were selling coffee as a lost leader. And so all these families, ethnic families, because all the grocery stores in Fresno were ethnic. There was the Italian grocer, the Armenian grocer, the Volga German grocer, the Swedish grocer, the Chinese grocer, the Japanese grocer, the Malacan grocer. Um, but we couldn't compete. And at one point, my dad said everything was a lost leader. Uh, you know, we were sell trying to, you know, outsell Safeway, it didn't work. So one by one, the grocery stores went bankrupt. And one day my dad came home and said, I bought a restaurant. So my dad was a trained grape grower. He graduated from Fresno State, got a football scholarship to USC, came back, got a viticulture degree. But here he went into the restaurant business. And I remember walking into this restaurant the first time and there was a 40 foot long bar with all these bar stools. And, and a, in the back was, um, was a, a little kitchen. And he decided very early on that the kitchen, the food didn't make any money. And he went to pure booze, put a dance floor, um, a band, and he became the first rock and roll nightclub that was charging a cover charge between LA and San Francisco, was the hottest rock and roll club in Fresno. My dad was the son of a communist. My grandfather was a communist. The FBI followed him for 45 years. He was wearing diapers and they were still following him. And so my dad had this idea that he can mix the races in Fresno. And that was a very volatile, dangerous experiment because Fresno was one of the most partitioned cities in California. Um, my dad grew up with restrictive real estate covenants that kept the Armenians on a certain side of town. The covenants I have them, it says no black, which is strange because there were no blacks in, in 1910 in Fresno. But I guess any self-respecting, uh, you know, code that's going to ban anybody would start with blacks. So there's no blacks, no orientals, that was the word no Punjabis, and no Armenians. So he is, his idea was he was going to mix all the races with music. And uh, I remember in 1971, he said, I'm bringing Chuck Berry to town. Oh, I wanted to go so badly. I was like 13, 14. 
And he said, no, you can't come. And so we had two shows. Chuck Berry drove up in a, in a Cadillac, top down. He duck walked across that tiny stage. And they emptied out the bar and he, had a, he gave a second show. And I got to clean up the bar afterwards. So that was my, <laughs> and boy, I, I was able to kind of reconstruct the night Oh, it was a wild night, just from what was left behind, okay? And I won't get into details there. <laughs> so six months later, he went off to work January 2nd to count the New Year's Eve receipts. The bar was empty except for a, 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 a female bartender. My dad was the first person to have female bartenders in the valley and you know, charge, a cover charge. Um, the bar was empty. Two guys came in wearing gloves, played a game of pool, left behind a fingerprint on the pool, bought one of the pool, the cue ball, and then shot him. And that was it, this mystery for 30 years, never solved. Left behind this great question. You know, who was he? You know, he's my football coach, my baseball coach, cared about the community. But when someone runs a nightclub that popular and is murdered, all sorts of rumors. You know, and the rumors were everywhere. And my brother, who was five or six, you know, was getting into fights at school and I was trying to intervene. And when your narrative is thrown, kind of torn like that, what do you do? Well, what I did is I grabbed the tape recorder and I started taping family stories. And I went to my two grandfathers. One was a priest of the Armenian church. The other one was the communist and a poet. They were completely opposite in politics. The one who was the priest wanted Armenia to be independent. The one who was the poet and the communist said, no, we cannot survive without being part of the Soviet Union. It was my job to fix them a highball on Christmas, they sat down, they drank, and somehow they made peace. So when I put the tape recorder in front of each of them, they had never talked about the genocide that had brought them to America. Their children didn't want to extract that story, but I did. So when I went to the priest, um, I put the tape recorder in front of them, and I said, Haidig, which means father in Armenian. I want to ask you about the past and the genocide. And, and he started, his lips started trembling. And he took my tape recorder and he straightened it out. It was a little crooked. And then he started chanting these names, names I'd never heard before. 45 names, Bagdasar. Anush, just one after the other. And I didn't know where he was going, but these were the 45 family members that were all killed, leaving only him as a 12-year-old. It was, the way he started, it was almost like a, um, a dirge, a funeral dirge or something. And I got the story from him. Then I went to the poet and he, he told me his story, and this is what I started gathering as a narrative. I took that tape recorder, basically, I still have the tape recorder, it's an old Sony, it's pretty shot now, but I've replaced it with others. And I have gone, starting in our own backyard and then expanding from the middle of California all the way outward. I've taken that tape recorder and recorded something like probably 900 hours of oral histories starting with the Armenians and then moving to all the other groups who came there for the soil and grafted their narrative onto that fertile ground. Um, at some point, it started making sense to me what I was doing. And I thought I'd be a journalist, you know, how to be a writer and have a family, a very tough thing to do. So I thought, well, I'll be a I'll, I'll make money as a newspaper guy and then I'll slowly teach myself how to write longer form narratives and then I will, you know, write books. And that's kind of what I did. 
I had to confront the place Fresno because uh, I grew up, like, like all of us, we all grew up kind of dumb to our place. And so the interrogation began there and then it moved beyond. Um, I'd like to do, th this is a nice little segue where I'm going to read you the beginning a little bit of this book because there's always a challenge in me trying to explain that middle of California. When you cross over from LA and you drop down the grapevine, that Tehachapi, and you drop down, you are entering, you're crossing a Mason-Dixon line, really. It's a place with its own ethos, its own rules, its own arrested sense of development, its code of ethics, its corruption, its hubris, its arrogance, all of it. It's, 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 in it, but it also has this kind of weird honesty to it. The people aren't, I won't say they're not as sophisticated because in some ways they're very sophisticated, but there's not this kind of artifice, this, this, uh, this notion that you have to varnish yourself a little bit as you're telling your story. They invite you into the living room and they tell it just like your family member. And it's been a privilege to gather those stories. Some of them make me wince when I hear the truth that's coming out of their mouths. So that place is different. And I had to understand that difference before I understood the rest of California. So the challenge in writing about the valley is to not steal my passwords. I mean, I, I think it's all right to plagiarize yourself. But um, you know, sometimes like when I do a piece for the New York Times, They'll say, that language sounds very familiar to a piece you wrote three years ago. I said, yeah, it's, it's lifted straight from the piece. Can we vary the language a little bit? I said, no, it was written so well. But, you know, so anyhow, I've got to vary the language. So this was an attempt of, of basically for all those folks who don't know the, the center of the state, who've never driven down 99, I'm trying to tell them what it is. And so let me just switch out glasses here. This will take about six, seven minutes, and then we'll, it'll segue into the next part. On a summer day in the San Joaquin Valley, 101 in the shade, I merge onto Highway 99 past downtown Fresno in steer through the vibrations of heat. I'm headed to the valley's deep south, to a little farm worker town in a far corner of Kern County called Lost Hills. This is where the biggest farmer in America, the one whose mad plantings of almonds and pistachios have triggered California's nut rush, where he keeps on growing, no matter drought or flood. He doesn't live in Lost Hills. He lives in Beverly Hills. How has he managed to outwit nature for so long? The GPS tells me to take Interstate 5, the fastest route through the belly of the state, but I'm partial to Highway 99, the old road that brought the Okies and Mexicans to the fields and deposited a twang on my Armenian tongue. 99 runs two lanes here, three lanes there, through miles of agriculture broken every 20 minutes by fast food, gas station, and cheap motel. Tracks of houses, California's last affordable dream civilized three or four exits, and then it's back to the open road, splattered with the guts and feathers of chickens that jumped ship on the slaughterhouse drive. Pink and white oleanders divide the highway, and every third vehicle that whooshes by is a big rig. More often than not, it is hauling away some piece of the valley's unbroken bounty. 
The harvest begins in January with one type of mandarin and ends in December with another type of mandarin. And in between comes everything in your supermarket produce and dairy aisle, except for bananas and mangoes, though the farmers here are working on the tropical too. I stick to the left lane and stay ahead of the pack. The big rig drivers are cranky two ways, and the farm workers in their last leg vans are half asleep. 99 is the deadliest highway in America. Deadly in the rush of harvest, deadly in the quiet of fog, deadly in the blur of Saturday nights when the field work is done and the beer drinking becomes a second humiliation. 20 miles outside Fresno, I cross the Kings, the river that irrigates more farmland than any other river here. The Kings is bone dry as usual. To find its flow, I'd have to go looking in a thousand irrigation ditches in the fields beyond. There's a mountain range to my left and a mountain range to my right and in between a plain flatter than Kansas where crop and sky meet. One of the most dramatic alterations of the Earth's surface in human history took place here. The hillocks that existed back in Yokut Indian days were flattened by a hunk of metal called the Fresno Scraper. Every river busting out of the Sierra was bent sideways, if not backward, by a bulwark of ditches, levees, canals, and dams. The farmer corralled the snow melt and erased the valley, its desert and marsh. He leveled its hog wallows, denuded its salt brush, and killed the last of its mustang, antelope, and tule elk. He emptied the sky of tens of millions of geese and drained the 800 square miles of Tulare Lake dry. He did this first in the name of wheat, then beef, milk, raisins, cotton, and nuts. Once he finished grabbing the flow of the five rivers that ran across the plain, he used his turbine pumps to seize the water beneath the ground. As he bled the aquifer dry, he called on the government to bring him an even mightier river from afar. Down the great aqueduct, by freight of politics and gravity, came the excess waters of the Sacramento River. The farmer commanded the distant flow. The more water he took, the more crops he planted, and the more crops he planted, the more water he needed to plant more crops. And on and on. One million acres of the valley floor, greater than the size of Rhode Island, are now covered in almond trees. Since this was written, it's now 1.6 million acres. I pity the outsider trying to make sense of it. My grandfather, a survivor of the Armenian genocide, traveled 7,000 miles by ship and train in 1920 to find out if his uncle's exhortation, the grapes here are the size of jade eggs, was true. My father, born in a vineyard outside Fresno, was a raisin grower before he became a bar owner. I grew up in the suburbs where our playgrounds were named after the pioneers of fruit and irrigation canals shot through our neighborhoods to farms we did not know. For half my life, I never stopped to wonder how much was magic, how much was plunder. Thank you.
So 99 is a magical road. It's deadly, but it's magical. If you can make it out alive, it takes me to all the places I need to go. When I went to Paradise to write that piece five years after the fire for the New York Times, I just went straight up 99. I couldn't believe when I got there how much it had changed. All the trees that had burned were chopped down and carted off. The, they were like, the stumps were like headstones. Um, and they decided, the state of California, the feds, to rebuild the town. And it just, it was built uh, in an act of madness over a century, right in the path of Western wildfire. And because all those trees are gone, they think maybe they've changed the nature of the place. Um, I just think they've dressed up human folly in a different costume now as it greets climate change barging through the door. That's a line from the piece. I stole it. Okay. Um, In 1998, I got a call from my colleague at the LA Times. He was in Sacramento and he said, Mark, Tulare Lake has come back to life. I said, what's Tulare Lake? He says, well, pull out a map. So I pulled out my Rand McNally and he said, trace your finger down to Corcoran. And I did. He says, do you see that lake? And I say, well, I, I, I said, I see something. It's blue. It's actually painted blue on the map, but it's square. He said, that's Tulare Lake. <laughs> so I said, well, I got to see this thing. So it was a day or two later. I drove down 99, then on to Highway 43, and got near Corcoran. And the, in front of me was this huge earthen levee, a dike. And the road stopped. I parked my car right there and I climbed up this dike. And as I got to the top of it, the air changed. The crown, I, I looked out and the richest cotton land in America had been turned into an inland sea. And I felt a little, a little vertigo, you know, and to watch the speed with which nature had found itself again was extraordinary. There were all sorts of shorebirds, and they were trying to catch fish. In five, six days, the lake had come back. And I, when I looked at these telephone poles out there, I could see that there were watermarks on the telephone poles marking the spots of the previous floods. So in spite of all of man's efforts, all the contrivances of dam, ditches, canals, pumps that actually stopped the rivers and made them run backward. In spite of all that, the lake had come back in a monster snowmelt rain year. And that's what happened this year. Driving back, I thought, there's a book here, this lake. You know, it was, as I researched it, it was the largest body of fresh water west of the Mississippi. And as I started visiting the people in and around those towns, there were all these ethnic groups. And that place became their place of employment and living. One day driving down 99, about four or five months later, I saw on the perimeter of Tulare Lake, a shack, and it looked like this shack had been lifted out of the 1920s, 30s Mississippi Delta. I thought, oh my God, that thing is still standing. It was a winter day, and I could see puffs of smoke coming out of this stovepipe in, uh, in the roof, the tar paper roof. I thought, my goodness, someone's inside there. So I pulled off the road. I believe it was uh, Avenue 76 crossed the railroad track and took this dirt road along a vineyard and there was this house. And um, I looked in the backyard, there was an outhouse in the back 
and all these oddments of the decades. An old car, washing machines, everything out there. And I thought, okay, what do I do? So the house was built up on some stilts because of the, the flood would come back. And I said, well, I got to knock on the door. So I knocked on the door and I could see that there were rabbit pelts that had been nailed to cracks and I could see cardboard in the cracks. And then above I looked and I could see Vienna sausage cans that had been put into the crevices of the roof so it wouldn't fall. I knocked once, twice, took a moment to creak open and there above me was a black man named Mr. Dixon, 98 years old. He invited me in his place he was sleeping on metal, basically, and there was a beekeeper's box. He had a stutter, and he was nervous. He thought I was with the county, and I was coming to shut him down. No. I said, no, I'm here to write a story. What brought you here? And he started explaining how he'd come from the south uh, to pick cotton, follow the railroads. And I said, are there others like this, like you here, and he said, yes, across Highway 99, there's a whole community, but they're all dying. So I told him I'd be back, went across, and for the next two years, I documented black Okies who Steinbeck had never documented, who were living in the alkali dust because each of these towns had restrictive real estate covenants so they couldn't live there. And they all had worked picking cotton. And so I got all this oral history and all this stuff. And then it was going to take me 10 years to write that book. And I joined up with a friend of mine, Rick Wartzman. And we wrote it together. And it took us five years. And he did the Washington stuff because he was back there covering the Clinton White House at the time for the Wall Street Journal. And I did all the California stuff. And the Washington stuff was how the dams got built, okay? And the politics behind the building of those dams. The declaring of a lake, the greatest lake west of the Mississippi, an actual flood zone, okay? I mean, it's when you see that in the documents, that Tulare Lake is a flood zone, and we now have to dewater it. I'd never seen the word dewater before, but there it was. That became that whole journey. And all the oral histories of the workers, the Latinos, blacks, and white Okies, I got to tell. An extraordinary experience. Uh, I remember giving a lecture at Fresno State four or five years ago, and it was students and folks like you. And there were two black girls in the black in the back, and they said, and they were talking to each other. I think they were trying to get up the courage to ask me a question. And they said, "Mr. Arax, um, that history you got was extraordinary. Thank you for doing it. But what gave you?" And I said, "The right." And they said, "Yes, I guess the right to do that." And this is before everybody became hypersensitive to appropriation and cultural boundaries and this kind of stuff. And I didn't know how to answer that. And I said, I was there. I had a tape recorder. The LA Times had given me two years so I could double dip for the book and them. And I went there knowing that I was stepping into something that wasn't my narrative. And, and I had to reach deep inside for the patience and everything else to try to get the story right. I've since, and this might be a little glib, but I, I, I think that you can't tell writers what to write about. I just don't think you can. Well, you get into dangerous territory. Back in the day at the LA Times, sometimes they would assign Latino writers to Latino subjects, Jewish writers to the Middle East, black writers to the South. And 
those writers complained. They said, what is this? This is a weird kind of, you know, what, what we can't write about anything but ourselves. And now we're confronted with a moment where, where do we go? Um, I wasn't William Styron writing The Confessions of Nat Turner, where a white man actually inhabited the brain of a black man. I think that, that crosses a line. I don't know that even the greatest powers of fiction can allow that. But I always go in as an Armenian whose family had been you know, kept out with those, that same brush of racism from neighborhoods. And I go in and try to get that story down. And sometimes it falls short, sometimes it doesn't. 99 has given me the boys of McFarland. How many of you have seen that movie? I, I was, uh, it was the, the boy runners of McFarland. I wrote that story. I found them running along 99 one day. And I said, uh, um, Coach White was the coach. And he gave me a bicycle. And I just followed the boys like he did for three months and wrote this story. As I started digging deeper, I saw what we had done to the valley, which became kind of a, a metaphor for what we had done to the whole state. And this book really is a journey. It's a, it's a little, um, it, 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 it meanders. It's kind of like a river. And what I'm trying to do is find how agriculture took its footprint. And what you see from the narratives and then from archival things and everything else is that the valley started farmland where it made sense on the alluvial plain where the water was easy to get just by, via a ditch irrigation canal and the ground was good there was recharge and then this kind of growth ethic capitalism took hold. And then that footprint moved beyond the river. And it was allowed to move beyond the river because of the turbine pump. My grandfather came in 1920, the first year the turbine pump was used. And the aquifer started dropping. By, by 1928, we had eight years, six, seven, eight years of drought in the 20s. Farms were drying up. And that's when the call of the farmers said, hey, we've run out of our backyard river and it's recharge. We want to go deeper into the earth, but our pumps don't reach that far. At least not then they didn't. So send us the excess flows of the Sacramento River. And that was the beginnings of the Central Valley Project, the federal project that moved floodwaters from Sacramento to the valley. But that wasn't enough. So... They kept going deeper and deeper into the earth. The earth sinks. The aqueduct sinks. The very infrastructure is sinking. So when you're trying to use the gravity flow to pump water from the delta up and over the mountain into Southern California, there are dead spots now where the ground has sunk so much and we're all paying a tremendous amount of electricity costs to pump that water through the dead spots. And it's just sinking. The ground is sinking. It's extraordinary. Um, then we get something that is supposed to save us all. It's called drip irrigation. We bring the Israelis in. They teach us how to do this drip. And it makes sense. But the problem is that drip irrigation doesn't recharge the aquifer. It doesn't go down. Not only that, it increases yields to the point where it taps into the greed of the farmer. Oh, my God, I got this incredible yield. I'm going to use more, and I'm going to take this drip line, and I'm going to take it uphill, and I'm going to plant orchards on hillsides. And you know that ground over there that my grandfather would never plant and my father would never plant because it's really terrible ground? Well, now we've got this drip line that's an umbilical cord, and it's delivering a precise dose of chemical, fertilizer, and water to that tree. And the the dirt is almost irrelevant. You might as well be hydroponically farming. The dirt is simply there to hold up the tree. 
And so the footprint of agriculture has expanded to places it should never have expanded to. And now we have this law called Sigma where we're trying to reduce the, the draw of the groundwater to keep the land from sinking. And yet to call back that land is very hard to do. And I don't know if the state has the wherewithal to tell those locals that this is not sustainable. You're going to have to retire this ground. In Kern County alone, the head, the Kern County farms 900,000 acres. The head of the Kern County Water Agency, as he was leaving his job, I said, what is it going to take for this county to be sustainable? He said that even in flood years, they were stealing from the aquifer and that in Kern County alone, 350,000 acres would have to go idle. So we're looking in the San Joaquin Valley, if things were done right, a million and a half acres to be idled. So the book goes to the biggest farmers, and I don't know why, you know, they opened their door to me. I mean, the Resnicks were, you know, Linda Resnick never wanted Stuart Resnick to talk to me. Um, she wanted to, you know, she was the pomegranate princess. She wanted to write her own story, but he did. And uh, he, got, he got some, you know, hell for it. Um, but I thought it was a fair portrait. And I'm with the big guys and with the small guys. So you're seeing all who's drawing the water, how, why. What's happened now is another kind of madness. The, we've overplanted the almond. Okay, and the price has gone from five dollar a pound to a buck fifty. Farmers are trying to sell the ground. Some are selling to bigger farmers, but now who's come in? Hedge funds, pension funds, the Mormon Church, huge farmer, the Canadian Royal Mounties. Their pension fund is buying up tons of ground, and they hire these custom farmers. I love that name. Not a custom rancher. That's a custom farmer. And I got buddies who are custom farmers. They make a great living. I said, I asked one of them, I said, Brad, how does this go? He says, well, they come out with their spreadsheets. And they say, here's the, our calculation. And I just nod my head. It's, he says, the calculations are off by, by a magnitude of 10, okay? Um, five years later, the guy comes back with the spreadsheet and he says, they live with it for a while because the losses in farming allow them to write off some of the gains in the other parts of their pension funds. But five years later, it comes, they go, what, what's going on here? We're losing money. I said, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. Too many crops, okay. The international market for pistachios and almonds has kind of collapsed. This is the reality. Now these guys are buying for the water alone, and this is the next game. And this is the sickest of the games because it's a, it's a Ponzi scheme even beyond farming. So that's, that pretty much explains the 520 pages of this book. Um, some people are critical. They say, why is your personal story in there? And I thought, well, you know, the, one of the great books that preceded this was Cadillac Desert, and Mark Reisner was from the East Coast. So I couldn't write the way he wrote that. I, I, I'm writing with blood and guts and you know family, and my grandmother telling me never go to an irrigation canal because you'll drown, you know. And so, and she had an irrigation canal, a big one, two doors down from their house. I said, why will I drown? She says, because the flow of one irrigation canal is more important to this valley than the life of one silly boy. So that's the book. Um, I think I'm done with water. Okay, I don't want to write about water anymore. I, I thought I was done with it after the King of California, but I think I'm truly done with it, although I keep getting asked to do things. And water will always be. I mean, I got, I got a novel I'm working on. I, there's some water winding its way through that. Um, but anyhow, I went a little long, but I love to have some questions here. Um, and so was the best part. So go ahead. Thanks so much for your presentation.
as an East Coaster, I'm, I'm sort of a, a virgin out here. And uh, I wondered, how do you, I, I remember the film uh, Chinatown that came out yeah. about the water politics of the 20s, 30s, the Chandler family, everything around LA heading to the mountains. What's the, the different, what are the, the nuances, the differences in, in, in your water problem in the Central Valley and, and, and that water problem, <laughs> politically, let's say, or, or in any. In it's any the sense. same. It's the same. I mean, there's just not enough water. I mean, when we built the, the federal project and the state project, there, you know, federal project, there were 13 million Californians. There's 40 million now. Um, you know, when, when everybody's wringing their hands that, boy, man, more people moved to Texas than Texas came to California, I think, well, good. Okay. I mean, we, we've got to figure out a way to make our water, you know, I mean, I don't know that, I don't know, I got asked once, is fighting climate change compatible with capitalism? I was at a junior college, and I didn't know how the hell to answer that. I said, I, I should have said, well, the version of capitalism we're practicing right now, no, it isn't. But I said something a little more stupid than that, got some hell for it. That grandpa of the communist isn't so far, you know, away from me sometimes. Um, but it's it's about a resource that, you know, has a limit to it. And back then, L.A. ran out of its puny L.A. River. And it decided that to grow, it had to go 230 miles up and over the mountain and steal somebody else's river. And they did. And that set that in motion. So when the valley farmers, you know, you know, 15 years later, in the middle of a drought, say, we need the Sacramento River, where there's your example. L.A. had gone up and over and stolen Owens. So it's just the way it is. Every region is stealing from the other region. It's this weird cascade. I hope that answered some of it, yeah. Uh, I read your book and loved it. I sent it to a friend of mine that works for Cayugas Water, and he said it's on their book list. Um, I was wondering, I can't remember in the book if you looked at the state crop insurance program. Did you talk about that in the book? Uh, I, I talked about crop insurance because um, farmers can make money a lot of ways. You know, they're, they're, farmers are the greatest whiners in the world. It's that, you know, when the weather's bad, they complain about it. When the weather's good, they complain about it. Crops are too much, they complain about that because, you know, crops are not enough, they complain about that. But if you look, and Basel was a master at this, you know, when a flood would come, well, wait a second. Sir, you're, you're, you're farming the bottom of a lake. A flood is going to come. But no, he's insured against that, okay? So crop insurance, I, they, they claim it never, it just covers the loss, but I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a game. So that, that, that's, that's about as deep as I've gone into cr uh, crop insurance, looking at some of these disaster years and the checks these guys got for you know, planting a crop in a year that happened to be wet. Yes. How much longer do you think they can keep stacking up this house and cards? I don't know. I mean, the sprawl model of farming is the sprawl model of suburbia. Okay. You know, I come to Santa Barbara. And, you know, it could be a, a precious little place. Okay. But man, they do a lot of smart things with growth. Okay. And yeah, they 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 overextended their footprint. And when that flood comes and those boulders are rolling down the thing and, you know, how do we keep them from rolling and crashing into houses? Well, we'll create these incredible rubber, rubber bands and just keep them from rolling. Okay, well, that's ingenuity. Um, every place is taking the land to an extreme, and I don't know how we get back. I like to think that climate change will be the, the pretext for politicians to say, hey, we can't go into paradise anymore. We just can't do that. 
we have to, the footprint has to be much smarter. So the house of cards, I, I don't know. I don't know when it collapses. It's, it's had collapses along the way, and yet something comes to save it, or at least to make the people believe that they could do it a smarter way. Yes. What are the groundwater regulations in California? I had hopes for this thing. It's called Sigma. But they, they gave it a 20-year startup time. And what that did is that gave these farmers every incentive to dig more wells even deeper to show that they have a historic use of the water so they're grandfathered in to the calculation. I was talking to a, a friend today who said that he's looking into uh, the fact that the state of California, as their metric for what can be taken, used the most extraordinary drought years of 2007 to 2015, all the pumping that went on during that time. They're using that as the standard, the allowable standard moving forward. Now that is, if that's true, that, that's criminal. That sustainability is based on the worst extraction that ever took place in the history of California. I, I told them we need to dig into that. So much for my forswearing of water stories. Yes, yes. I think that's where we're seeing a lot of this co-optation of the environmental justice narrative. I think that's one of the major things that we're, like at least researchers are kind of looking at, is how to combat that narrative of co-optation. So, like you said, the capitalists will just come in and reconfigure the standard or reconfigure some type of threshold that allows them to do exactly what they're trying to do. And so I guess my question is, is how can we confront some of these public policy narratives that are so firmly embedded in how the state of California operates that it continues to do so today with, for example, Governor, Governor Newsom allowing the completion of the site's reservoir, which is a $5 billion project which has $800,000 of uh, state constituent money and is figuring out how to get the other $4 billion from the people who you wrote the book about and also the pensioners and the hedge funds that have come in to infiltrate how this policy is constructed. Yeah, what they're so, doing now is they're, they've, they're, they've got this water plan. They think, see, the new word is recharge. We're going to capture. resiliency also. What'd you say? Resiliency is yeah. also oh, the big really, buzzword that yeah, allows this yeah. co-optation. Resiliency, yeah. Um, so recharge. Well, floods don't come along that often here. Droughts linger a lot longer than floods do you're not gonna be able to recharge your way out of this thing, but that's the new buzzword, and they're getting these money guys to come in and build recharge basins, and that will allow them to extract more groundwater. They, they really want out of this thing. So um, I, 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 I look at dairies, okay. Mega dairies went from Chino and Southern California up and over the mountain to the San Joaquin Valley 30 years ago. We have dairies that have 20,000, 25,000 Holsteins. The air is already the worst air in the country in the San Joaquin Valley, and the dairy waste makes it even worse. It's polluting groundwater. Dairy cows, through their silage and alfalfa, are the biggest drinkers of water in the state, far more than almonds. Mega dairies do not belong in California. Our water is too valuable. Our land is too valuable. Happy cows should be going. I'm dating myself with that one. That old man. But happy cows should be going to Colorado and New Mexico. Instead, what we've done is we're greenwashing them with these methane digesters, which are a bunch of bullshit. Okay, they're not creating and capturing anything, and they're increasing their herd sizes to create more stuff to turn into methane. It's the same way with the carbon credits and everything else like you're talking about. It's just rigged. And I don't know, you know, the problem is we need a, a thousand investigative journalists looking into it. 
and papers, though, are just dying. I mean, look at your great local paper. It's gone, basically. I know there's a, one of the weeklies is trying to do its best. God bless it. But who would have thought that the Santa Barbara would not have its daily? I, does it, is it still around in a, in a thing form? No, it isn't. It's gone. McGraw. McGraw? Yeah. McGraw? Oh, hi. Thank you for your talk, the incredible imagery. And I know you're trying to avoid water right now, but um, your last name refers to an entire river in the Caucasus. I just wanted to know the backstory a little bit behind your last name. Arox is a river. Okay. I was walking the streets on my five-mile walk today, and I came across a man who looked Armenian to me. He was uh, a security guard at the bank. And uh, he said, no, I'm, uh, I said, well, what nationality are you? He says, I'm Italian. I said, you are? He said, yes. And I said, uh, where, 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 where'd you grow up? He said, uh, uh, Rome. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking. And I said, you're not Italian, are you? He said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm Armenian. He said, I'm Persian. I'm Iranian. He said, I learned never to say that I'm Iranian to any stranger. And then we talked about Gaza and what happened in the kibbutzes of Israel. And man, I was there for 25, 30 minutes talking to this guy. He was wonderful. He knew, he knew Ayatollah Khomeini when he was a younger man. Knew him, actually. So he said, Aras, Arax, Araz, that's the river, A-R-A-S. And I said, yes, it's A-R-A-X, though, the way my grandfather spelled it. And uh, after the genocide, my grandfather came down from his attic where he was hiding with these French books by Verlaine and Maupassant and Baudelaire. He had outlasted the Turks by reading French symbolic poetry. And he came down and he went to work for the last Armenian bookstore in Istanbul. It was called Babikians. He was 15. And some of the surviving Armenian writers, great ones, Oshagan and others, um, took him as their charge. And they were trying to find what words were left after the genocide. So we need to give you a pen name. His name was Johnny Gosepian, my grandfather. He said, how about Aram Aslan? Aslan means lion. Well, my grandfather was 5'4", about 112 pounds. Didn't quite conjure up the image of a lion. So they read some more of his poetry, and they said, you know, your poetry flows nicely sometimes, and then it gets kind of stuck in mud sometimes. How about Aram Arox after our river? And that became the last name, Arox. There, I don't know that there are many, if any, Aroxes with that last name. Arox is a kind of a good luck name Armenians give to their toy stores and their markets and things like that. But I think we're the only Aroxes, okay? And uh, when my grandfather came down from that thing a wealthy Armenian railroad magnate read his poetry and said, I'm going to send you to the Sorbonne. My grandfather had a ticket to the Sorbonne. And then the letters from his surviving uncle who had left Turkey after the genocide and went to Fresno arrived. And these are these letters where he told them the watermelons are so big here that when we scoop out the meat, we could float down the irrigation canals in them. It was real bullshit, as my grandfather would say. <laughs> Paris, France, or Fresno, California. My grandfather took the bait, and I'm still there. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It seems like there is a conflict between the uh, people who raise cows and the people who, uh, the people who raise uh, salad dressing and, and other kinds of uh, greens that get polluted by the cow things? Are, are, there, are those farmers 
fighting each other or are they the same farmers? No, I think what? most of the lettuce, we get some lettuce that's grown on the west side in Huron, but most of it's in Salinas, and that's kind of dedicated to its ve veggies. And, you know, um, the, the cows do pollute, the Holsteins really pollute the rivers. In fact, all those rivers that fed into Tulare Lake were washing just ungodly amounts of dairy into there. And it was no wonder that as soon as a little heat came, the botulism exploded in the Tulare Lake Basin. There's a movement to try to bring back Tulare Lake. And some of the Yokuts have joined up with some other environmentalists. And I think there might be a case that Tulare Lake could come back. Okay, We have to retire and pay out some of those farmers. Or maybe they could put some, you know, who knows. But that is a dream that I think um, got a little more life this last year. Let's see what happens. Hi, I'd like to go back to something you said about um, hedge funds. The hedge funds are now buying up the land for water. And could you play that out a little bit more in terms of both how they're hiding it and what you see, what, what, they're, what, what they're trying to do in the future, why they're trying to do that? I don't know that they're hiding it. Um, if you, it, it sometimes takes some work to find it, but they're, they're making a play on the water. And they're using Sigma as kind of running interference for them, which is kind of ironic, you know, that this state regulation would do that. And, and they're putting enough, you know, sales into it that, and these are p big name money people, and, you know, and I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you just hope that journalists, you know, there's a very fine water journalist for the LA Times, a guy named Ian James. Are you familiar? He's doing some good stuff. There's not many of them left, but, you know, to expose what's happening is important, I think. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about how I'm, I'm from the UK, and in the UK, I mean, in the 70s, in the 60s, we had a pretty big uh, kind of backlash to some environmental movement, or what could have been termed environmental movement, in closing down the coal industry. Um, and now in London, we're seeing a lot of environmental movement, which is great, but there's still some backlash about people thinking they're being priced out, um, or the prices are getting you know too high for the for the average person. Um, and in the region, you know, in the valley, and with a lot of people that are living there. Are they worried about you know, anything changing that might move them out? Would that be potential backlash? And how would that kind of work with keeping the people who are there, you know, not leaving them behind? It's a good question. I did a magazine piece about four months ago for the New York Times where I focused on these three women who had started this movement. Um, it's not, you know, I, I won't call it social justice, okay, because that's, I don't know what that means sometimes. But these are... Two Latinas and, and a Jewish point guard. She was a great point guard. They've gathered and they're doing extraordinary things. They're putting pressure. They're getting measures passed with uh, public funding for parks. You know, Fresno had the worst park to citizen ratio in America. And they, ra and they raised all. So, so there is some energy, okay? I think after George Floyd, there was all this groundswell and some of the energy was dissipated and it didn't know where to park itself okay and some of it became a little too righteous maybe I don't know but I think it's finding some things now okay and it's changing debates you know I was driving down the street in Fresno the other day and hundreds of people had Palestinian flags I thought wow, what's something's going on here there's there's change that's happening um, uncomfortable to some, others saying long, long wait awaited. But I think that energy is finding places to go. And it's in Bravo. In, in, does it go to climate change? How, how do you tackle something so massive? Um, so I hope it doesn't end up what happened hap happened there in the you said in the seventies and eighties where it just kind of just lost its steam, right? Yeah. It's Kind of industries pulled out from cities that rely on people left without anything to do. Yeah. 
Let's see. Let's see if this thing gets real traction. Yes. Mark, thanks. Thanks for sharing your narratives. And it's the narratives that makes me think that you're not done with water. <laughs> that the narratives go back to the way we used to farm and how that farm supported communities and su supported the environment and the cultures that did all that. And we've moved, we've, we've lost so much of that. But those narratives help us bring it back. And we know that in the future, agriculture has to change. It's not just abandoned land. The opportunity of that land is to bring people back to it. And I think that's the story we need you to help us tell, what those narratives are that are those communities of the future that are going to grow the food in, in just and sustainable ways. I appreciate the sentiment in that question. I'll tell a little story. Uh, there was an Armenian farmer named Harry Rustigian that I went and knocked on his door one day. And I said, Harry, my name is Mark Arox. I pronounced it in the old country way. And I said, um, I'm, he I'm here to tell a story. He was, he was like 95. And he said, Arox, I've heard of you. He, he says, uh, uh, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a writer. He said, no, I, I know you're a writer, but what do you do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> so we became friends, and he was living in the farmhouse where in the 1920s, Sun Made Raisin wanted to build this giant co-op. And they didn't like the Armenians because the Armenians were packing with their own people. And they were going around as night riders with, in massive mobs with torches, uh, threatening to burn down Armenian farms if they didn't sign up with Sun Made. And Harry had lived through that. So Harry and I became friends. And about two, three years after we met, he said, I want you to come out to the farm. My son is taking out my grapes. I said, well, you, you, you agree to it? He said, yes, I have. But I don't know. It's, you know he's taking them out, and he's going to plant almonds. So I went out there, and Harry had this big leather hand, looked like an old-fashioned baseball mitt. He said, look at this. They, they, were, they were disking it under. He said, we're great people, okay? We go back 5,000 years with the grapes. He said, grapes is like blood. Grapes are in my blood. He said, um, what's an almond? Okay, I mean, and so I stood there for two hours and watched them disc a hundred-year vineyard into the ground. And Harry asked that three vines be kept near the water pump, just in memory. And he did, and we took a photo, and I wrote a story. I heard from my brother-in-law the other day that Harry died at 103. And um, I think he lived to see one almond harvest. <laughs> and he, you know, it was just uh, this, this passing of a torch to get to your question. The son didn't want to farm. A week after Harry died, they sold the ranch. Okay. So it's tough to pass on farms to kids. And that's something we have to fight against too. So I don't know if there's hope. I, I love the small farmer. I love the organic farmer. Maybe there's markets for them. But it's really tough to, to keep that tide of the big, big guys coming in. In some ways, Resnick... You know, I, I, Resnick is a, you know, he came to California in the 50s. Does he have dirt underneath his fingernails like Boswell did? No. But I, ta I take him over a hedge fund or a pension fund. Two more questions. Anybody? Any, any other? I think we're quite, okay. We'll go, we'll, we'll get that last question. Uh, is there any optimism regarding the agreement on the Colorado River? Distribution of water? Um, I think it's the first agreement. I, I think um, 
it solved some issues for now. Um, you know, Met, uh, Metropolitan Water District, is, it, it plays a different kind of game. You know, they're very skilled, and um, I don't know what their end game is. I, I can't see Southern California losing, you know, its, its complete share of the Colorado. Um, but I mean, the courts are going to look at that one, and I mean, it's a huge question. You know, you know, it's peace for now. Is that going to stay? What happens with the next drought? Yeah, you know, it's a pleasure talking to you all. It's good. It's fun. It's fun to share this book and the stories. Um, you probably wondered where in the hell is this guy going at the beginning of this thing? Is this going to be about water? But but I wanted to just tell a narrative. You know, a story of how someone gets interested into, the, in, into something like this. It's all to try to figure out their own backyard. And maybe if we do it all right, you know, you guys ought to all get tape recorders and record your grandparents if they're still around. If, if, and maybe the goal is, is that, we're, you know, by the time we're done, we're a little less dumb to our place. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah.